Salam sejahtera anda sedang menonton Awani Global bersama saya Nailah Huda. Minggu ini kita menyaksikan lawatan rasmi pertama Senator Penny Wong sebagai Menteri Luar Australia sejak dilantik oleh Perdana Menteri Anthony Albanese ke dalam Kabinet Baharu Australia bawah Kerajaan Labour Party. Namun Malaysia bukan tempat asing bagi Penny Wong yang menggambarkan lawatan ini sebagai lawatan balik kampung bagi beliau yang melawat ahli keluarganya di Kota Kinabalu dan berbanding dengan lawatan-lawatan lain oleh menteri-menteri luar dari negara lain, ini dilihat sebagai satu lawatan rasmi yang cukup istimewa dan mendapat banyak liputan media dan mungkin juga menandakan satu permulaan baharu buat hubungan antara Malaysia dan Australia selain daripada hubungan rapat Dapat Penny Wong bersama negara ini dan kita nak melihat lebih lanjut apakah signifikan dan kejayaan yang berjaya dicapai daripada lawatan rasmi ini dan apakah sebenarnya yang berada di keutamaan agenda Malaysia daripada hubungan bersama dengan Australia dan sudah bersedia untuk mengulas dengan lebih lanjut sudah bersedia bersama saya Izah Ibrahim penganalisis dari ISIS Malaysia dan izinkan saya teruskan dalam bahasa Inggeris uh, thank you Izah for joining me today to talk a little bit about uh, Senator Penny Wong's visit and surely uh, when we're looking at this trip it's rather different from the other official visits that we've seen uh, from other foreign ministers uh, Penny Wong herself described this trip as a trip to balik kampung uh, we know she She's from Sabah and so it is rather special. How do you see the significance of this trip and has it achieved anything? I think for starters as well, there's quite a lot of achievements for her as well. And as such a personal role for her, because not only is she coming as if to her balik kampung and all that, it's quite a big reflection on her own credentials because she's maintained such a significant position in Australian politics, you know, from starting as a um, representing South Australia since 2002. She's had past experiences as a climate um, for climate and finance as a minister and shadow foreign minister, in fact, as well since 2016. So for her, it's like it's a, um, it's another high point for her. And she, I'm pretty sure she can keep going if she goes at the pace that she is. And for the country as well, it's a big step forward as well, because we've all been hit by the pandemic quite seriously too. And mm. Australia just recently started opening their borders again and accepting people coming in and out. So this is exactly one of the best times to start, as we say, hit the ground running to reconnect with a lot of the countries that has been blocked off through for the past two, three years. Hmm. But beyond her personal credentials, uh, We want to look at this official visit, um, you know, as as a dim- diplomatic effort of its own. Do you perhaps see this also as an effort to deepen soft power in the region? Because you know we're seeing a lot of media coverage of this visit, and as well as um, a lot of the uh, efforts being done before uh, since being elected, uh, we've seen a lot of very personal videos and speeches being made. How do you see this approach? Um. One, I think, I think for starters, the disclaimer would be all countries, no matter how big or how small you are, you know, you don't have to be the US, you don't have to be China or Russia, or even middle powers like Australia, South Korea, Japan. Um, deepening soft power or the sort of country and people to people links are always something on the agenda. Because when you want, like, even if you want to look at it uh, practically, the benefits, the trickle-on effects and um, that you get from this is always going to be something that they value. So it'll make things easier in the future. So communication, um, trade, which is something Malaysia does all the time, which is why our foreign policy from the get-go is to be friendly, to be um, a, con- um, a big contributing member in international, um, international organizations and platforms. So in a sense, as we can say as well, referring back to our PM, how he says, like, we refer to it as a bit of a big family as well. Like, we want mm-hmm. to maintain these good links because it'll help us and we, as we are also a very trade-dependent nation. But at the same time as well, it's um, this sort of soft power is something as a, um, not to say, I mean, for some, I think for Australia, they will consider it a bit of a damage control sort of situation as well because mm-hmm. a lot has happened throughout the pandemic and Australia with the previous government has not exactly endeared themselves to some of the countries. China is the biggest example because they've cut off a lot of important um, primary resource um, trade, like energy and all that. So mm-hmm. this is exactly the time to rebuild that because we they can't keep going along on their own. 
So talking a little bit more about uh, Australia's relationship with Malaysia, what exactly is on top of the agenda for Australia? Before we move on to uh, Malaysia and what we want to get out of these relations, but uh, let's look at Australia for a second. What's, what's on their agenda? Um, at the moment, I'm just going to build on with that bit as well as saying like uh, extensive damage control was the big one too because not only there was quite a mess left by the Liberal, gov Liberal coalition government beforehand, there is a lot of rebuilding links as, as we've mentioned earlier. So not only is um, China the big issue, they also have to deal with a lot of the spillover effects left by the, by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So a lot of this is trying to Re, to reassure not only just the region, so like say the immediate Asia Pacific region of Australia's intentions, and also to put themselves in a position where they are able to have a bigger say. So like, for example, in the region, they've, they've done a lot of extensive visits, like right as soon as um, Senator Wong's finished um, with the official position, she's gone into the South Pacific to also tackle the issue of China's deepening links and um, cooperation with the Solomon Islands and a lot of the other of the other nations there, and they've also been working quite closely with New Zealand on this. And on the other hand, they also want to put, uh, they want, um, sorry, they want to look into other ways they can mm. assert their sort of perspective, which what she's done before as well with the current PM Anthony Albanese. They've been moving further into trying to represent an Indo-Pacific focus with NATO. So quite recently mm. as well, they've been trying to get. Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and Korea to become involved in these sort of discussions at NATO summits. Mm -hmm. So with this renewed approach, surely this creates more room, more opportunities for Malaysia to um, work harder to achieve what's on top of our agenda. So what exactly do we want to get out of this relationship with Australia that's probably um, looking more optimistic in the years to come? It, it, actually, you're quite right to build on that. It is quite optimistic because not too long before, we've just um, formalized a comprehensive strategic partnership, which was quite a big jump. And it was also quite extensively mentioned during the meeting between our foreign ministers, Afudin Abdullah, and during um, Senator Wong's visit. And so, yeah, the three areas that they were trying to look for is economic prosperity, so which is the biggest one on the table because it, what was it? Um, economic and domestic recovery post-pandemic is the biggest thing on the agenda for everybody. No matter how you want how you want to spin it, it's that's the biggest focus right now. And the other elements as well that they wanted to highlight as well. I think the biggest one that our foreign minister has mentioned was improving our people to people links, which is mm -hmm. quite big because of our, our considerable student population there. I mean, I, I'm one myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there's that. There's also the sort of regional security engagements too, which, you know, strengthening ASEAN and its institutions. We also have deepening our security links. And one of the few things especially was, sorry, um, and we mean when I mean by security, it's not necessarily defense of against mm -hmm. military threats. A lot of things that we've highlighted quite considerably was the um, was tackling this health crisis. Also other elements such as cybersecurity, um, also the other um, and a lot of the other disaster management is something that's quite big on the cards now. Speaking of defence, what also got a lot of attention was AUKUS. Probably something that we haven't heard a lot about um, in the news in the past few months. Uh, I would say it has rather died down, um, you know, conversations about AUKUS. But this has uh, seen a sort of revival, especially with, um, you know, Penny Wong's visit and how this has been uh, reiterated by our foreign minister, um, a rather uh, concern uh, for uh, AUKUS and what it could mean for the region and stability in the region. Do you still see this, or um, not still, but do you see this as still being a cause for concern or perhaps, um, you know, on, on an international level perhaps, but uh, when we're talking about people-to-people -people links, we also want to include um, the public's perception, the Malaysian public. Are they still concerned about uh, AUKUS and the potential risks that it could bring to the region? At the moment, I don't think there has been significant um, concerns about it because I think one of the really difficult things is that with Malaysia's own experience that we don't, quite fortunately, we haven't had that many experiences with existential threats. 
quite fortunate. There's no um, concerns of nuclear warfare, armed attacks has been very low for us, thankfully. So a lot of these things are really hard to visualize in the public mind. You know, it's not like, you know, the US or Russia who have grown up, especially in the 50s, the peak era, the peak era of that sort of fear. But not only that, and so the thing is that the most we've heard of is official statements. So that not not too long ago, um, our prime minister has mentioned quite, I would say, um, the way he has framed the concerns, such as one was allowing AUKUS to exist can set a negative precedent to China, Mm -hmm. meaning that they can, so if they were to assist other um, nuclear armed countries such as North Korea, um, they can do so because we already have these sort of submarines going around the, mm. uh, these waters as well. Um, and also similar statements where he's made in Nikkei, um, the Japanese news news platform, that AUKUS may also be taken advantage of by the major economies involved. Mm. Um, while I can understand these concerns because we because a lot of these game uh, sorry a lot of these security considerations can take on a much more dramatic. Um, lens to it Mm. it's just um, it may come from it but the one thing I I think is that it may be taken it may be misinterpreted a little bit too much which is um, which is why that while they're saying this um, like despite saying this not much has happened Mm -hmm. and but the problem is because we said this other countries that's why like Australia has um, had to come in as well to not just here we went to Vietnam and that's right. They went to Vietnam and Indonesia to do that same level of damage control and reassurance. Mm. And um, based off what has been said, um, they've both um, Senator Wong and um, our foreign minister have said that they've tried to informally talk this out, which is good because sometimes you don't have to be um, yeah. very, um, sorry, very transparent about this. So long mm-hmm. there is a government to government understanding. But I think one of the biggest things is always should as um in a way to ease the concerns is that they are quite adamant on stressing that these are nuclear propelled submarines they're not armed so i think that's the one thing for some people that it's easy to spook them by just Mm -hmm. having the word nuclear and it can kind of get people um panicking for maybe the wrong reasons and can push themselves to overreact more than necessary Now, I want to go back about this optimism that um, I think quite a lot of people share um, when we're looking at, uh, you know, now it's still rather early days for the Labour government, but there, uh, I think there is a general uh, optimism and hope for what's to come, um, and not just for Malaysia, but also just renewed strength uh, or a renewed and strengthened ties between Australia and other ASEAN countries as well. Do you see this optimism? Do you share this optimism? And have we so far seen a stronger approach from the new government? Um, I would agree it is a bit too early to tell. Um, It is quite, I mean, it is good for them that they've started this quickly. They didn't, um, what was it? They didn't dilly-dally, which is sometimes quite the concern for some countries. I mean, the US is quite a good example. After Mm -hmm. the the election of the Biden administration, they were quite slow in deploying and in in selecting the representatives for their foreign um, for the diplomatic for the diplomatic corps and then it became and to quite a lot of people especially in south in asia that they were wondering is this what is this why is this the case was it Mm -hmm. disinterest was it they were busy so it um by showing their initiative it at least sets a good start but at the moment given the current state of mistrust and concern that um i think it's a bit too early to start um, celebrating anything. Mm. I think at most we should give it a few more months. And also, I think when they would truly be tested if we start having more serious issues again. So let's say another re-emergence or another um, more developments in the Myanmar situation. Like how will they handle that? Mm. Or how will other, like how will they also respond to China uh, in the future, in the upcoming months or years? Mm. I do want to talk a little bit more about Myanmar later, but uh, going back to ASEAN, so it, it's still early for us to evaluate um, how they've done so far, but what kind of position 
does ASEAN want Australia to play in this region? That's actually a bit funny because it seems to be a big question mark on both sides because mm. Australia and, and another good point as well as New Zealand is one of them too. They really, mm. um, they do value their role as a dialogue partner and they also really value the sort of position ASEAN and its institutions have. So these are the things that they have identified to not only something they must support, but it's also something that they would also like to use should there be other tensions or security concerns in the region. But the issue is that sometimes, um, I mean, I think the biggest elephant in the room is the difference in values. And also some of the things ASEAN has from the start will not allow them, will not allow like the dialogue partners to get the sort of results they want. So meaning that, you know, for certain issues like humanitarian issues, what Australia would want or would want uh, achieved will be, will be something almost impossible given mm -hmm. certain principles in ASEAN, like our non-interference policies. Mm. Uh, I do also want to talk about Myanmar, uh, obviously a, a, a big concern for ASEAN at the moment and how Senator Penny Wong, Penny Wong recently has also signaled that Australia is likely to impose uh, new sanctions on Myanmar's military rulers, especially now uh, looking at the case of uh, Professor Sean Turnell, who is still in prison. Um, is there also optimism for how Australia is about to uh, step into this new area of, uh, you know, un under the new uh, Anthony Albanese administration. How are they going to handle uh, the Myanmar conflict, do you think? Um, do you see them playing a bigger role, uh, playing probably um, 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 a s tougher hand? What do you think? I think they, it, given the current responses, it's a bit of a they kind of have two fronts which can kind of be can kind of seem confusing to some because on one hand their humanitarian aid and support is still is one of the um it's quite strong and it's quite admirable as well because they have made a point to make sure that all the aid and everything has gone into the to non-government bodies and institutions because to make sure that they don't want to be supporting the 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 military regime in any any shape or form Mm -hmm. um, so they'd be looking for trusted partners, multilateral ones, NGOs, to make sure that these uh, the people, in, including the vulnerable population, gets this sort of support. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there has been some hesitation that we've seen because they, um, they weren't that quick to jump on the sanctions either because mm -hmm. um, they were saying that, um, because if we're referring to what the previous um, coalition government did, they believed that the sanctions weren't in their national interest and would run counter to ASEAN-led or ASEAN initiative solutions. So the problem is it's like they are, this goes back to a bit of that problem where um, they're not sure how they, like they want to use this regional platform, but the ideas of how they want to respond or to take a hard approach is not compatible. So it's mm -hmm. either they have to, um, I don't think they will want to take a unilateral, so like an Australia only response, but they probably have to be looking at other ways as well. So let's say um, other multilateral um, sanctions or other punitive actions to get that result they want. But at, but through ASEAN, I think there would be other approaches would be needed to do so. Hmm. And just uh, to delve a little bit deeper into the Myanmar conflict, as we know, um, some pr probably see that there's been a lot of time and space given to ASEAN um, and their own uh, approach in handling the conflict, as you say. Uh, do you think that there has been too much time and space given to them or is there a need for uh, perhaps a unilateral approach or other multilateral approaches, as you've mentioned? Um, yeah, the, it's a bit hard to say because with how difficult and also this was ongoing in the middle of a pandemic as well. So that sort of action can can um, may accidentally trigger something else so let's mm -hmm. say um it could make the healthcare crisis significantly worse mm -hmm. but also at the same time the given the sort of uh gov not government the leadership that they have right now um it's also the risk of we don't want any sort of like the re i think one of the biggest reasons why they didn't want to push any harder is because they fear for the human cost mm -hmm. because it is quite clear that that isn't uh that isn't holding them back 
to make sure that they can secure their position in power. But at the same time, it's I'm not sure whether um, whether whether unilateral approaches can work because at the moment, given the sort of other other forms of support Myanmar mm-hmm. can have, um, noticeably their connections with other uh, with other neighboring countries, it's I think it would be quite difficult to separate because other countries in the region too also have not necessarily similar backgrounds, but they also don't want to be they don't want that same attention should they be critiquing or should they be acting against it as well so i feel like there's a very awkward balance of um they don't know how much pressure to assert because they don't want something unwanted happening back towards them as well so with a lot on the plate right now i mean we we were talking about myanmar we're talking about asia and a lot of other things um i do want to talk a little bit about just how the domestic politics are going on right now in australia um as we've said a lot before it's early days for the new labor government under anthony albanese but um just talking a lot about uh this new approach in foreign policy for australia um how do you think perhaps the australian public is looking at this approach um not too sure because historically australian foreign policy has been quite bipartisan like it doesn't seem to be a you know there's no particular policies or there's no particular mm-hmm. actions that um are favored by one side or the other um it hasn't also been much issue brought up in elections actually mm-hmm. though um no at the same time i do feel that nowadays um given how increasingly polarized the world is right now we might we uh, like the australian public might and actually even um quite a lot of countries around the world my experience is too that um the sort of our actions or inactions in foreign policy can be leveraged against mm-hmm. public perception and i'm not sure with the how because <coughs> because given the current climate as well because given the I, again the unfortunately the pandemic is the biggest thing hanging over everyone's head right now so mm-hmm. i I'm not sure unless they can spin it in a way that these sort of new engagements can help them mm-hmm. so like if it can come back to show significant benefits to the country um it'll be a bit um it could be a non issue for them like they probably wouldn't respond as much but at the same time so well, I don't think it, I think it can be met with also mild disinterest because at this time not many people do want to look beyond unless it's those depending on some industries hmm I I do also want to talk about how the Malaysian public might view this. I mean, I I know foreign policy is also not uh, a, a rather popular issue for the public to discuss about, but uh, surely as you mentioned with the large Malaysian student population there and we're hearing a lot about immigration issues as well, um visa approvals and what not, um you know, beyond the Myanmar conflict, beyond AUKUS, uh, these are probably the kind of things that Malaysian Malaysians would want to hear um as a positive development from our relationship with Australia. So what do you think the Malaysian public uh would want to see out of this relationship moving forward and how do you think they would pro- probably see this official visit probably being seen as the first step to this renewed ties? I think one of the things is the better uh, is the increased business opportunities. So business I think tourism as well is a big one too for us because um a lot of countries in southeast asia significantly depend on that sort of industry to get um for people coming in and out so yeah i think um trade and economics is probably the biggest thing right right now um other people to people links because we see, we want to big um some of the things that we also have been trying to push for is more on engagements of cultural diplomacy and other sort of uh community based approaches that we can um that we can share as well so we're not trying to turn it too much of a um so it's like less political more of a social outreach as well mm. um but at the same time i think the most important i think if we want to let the public know that this needs to be more publicized or it needs to be felt because a lot of this really does come off at a very official level we haven't seen that much of that grassroots approach and that's why i feel like whenever we want to try talk about these um foreign relations it becomes really disconnected because yeah. we don't see it you know it's all behind these closed mm-hmm. doors behind official visits that um people that regular people can't attend or experience so i feel like this um for this to be felt more significantly is to be more on a grassroots 
community level approach and only then that we can really start um building and getting more out of the these um these relations with countries such as australia hmm. Plenty more I'd like to discuss with you, but unfortunately, that's all the time that we have today. Thank you so much to Isa Ibrahim, uh, analyst from ISIS Malaysia, uh, sharing her thoughts with me on Senator Pani Wong's visit this week. Terima kasih kepada Isa Ibrahim. Sudi bersama saya dalam Awani Global untuk kongsikan sedikit pandangan mengenai lawatan rasmi Senator Pani Wong, uh, Menteri Luar Australia. Itu saja masa kita ada untuk Awani Global pada jam ini. Sama saya, Nala Huda. Kita jumpa lagi. Salam hormat.